Hello, welcome to the introduction to proofs video for sets, identities, and counterexamples. My name is Professor Michael Poluk. The learning objectives for this video are, by the end of this video, you should be able to identify plausible set identities. You should be able to identify plausible locations for counterexamples to a false set identity. And you should be able to prove a set identity using the double subset technique. Our motivation for this section is how do we know when a set identity is true or false and how can we figure that out? So what do I mean by this? Here's a list of three uh, random examples I came up with of potential set identities. So these are all asserting that certain sets are related in some ways. Which of these three are true and which of these three are false? We're going to see a technique for proving the true ones but we also want to be able to identify ones that are false right away. So let's start by checking when is it that a set identity is false. Our first example is this set identity. The question is, is the union of A and B set minus C the same as A union B set minus C? This is an example that sometimes uh, students will make uh, when they're not thinking too hard about whether it's true or not, and they're just playing around with symbols. One major thing to help us here is a diagram. So a diagram is going to help us find when they're not the same and where to find a counterexample. A diagram on its own is not a proof, but it tells us where to look for a counterexample. So let's construct the diagrams for both of these sets. The one on the left is the set for A union B minus C. So for example, here's A, here's B, and I've cut out C from it. And then when I union them together, I get this stuff in the red here. So this is what A union B minus C looks like in general. Now let's try constructing the set on the right. So A union B, is this big set of double circles right here. And when we take off C, we bite out this whole chunk C. So we're left with just this shape. Now, are these two shapes the same? No, they're missing the, this. Uh, they're different by this piece right here. So that piece right there tells us exactly where to look for a counterexample. If we're trying to show that this equality doesn't hold in general, we need to find an example of sets A, B, and C, where the thing on the left and the thing on the right are different. Now, you could try randomly coming up with sets A, B, and C, and maybe they would work. But the more systematic approach is to find an example like this, or draw the picture, and that'll tell you where to look for those sets. So for us, we're looking for sets A, B, and C, where uh, there's something here. Put another way, we're looking for a spot where A intersect C is non-empty. So the simplest possible case I could think of is let them all be the set seven. And because, uh, because this part A intersect C is not empty, it'll show that these two are different. Well, let's see. So if you compute the set on the left, you get just seven. But if you compute the set on the right, you end up with zero, or the, sorry, the empty set. Now, if I was to just give you um, these three and say, hey, look, I computed them, they're different, it would be a little bit um, mystifying to you. And it would be, uh, I would not be a very good instructor if I just did that. So I'd rather tell you where, uh, where to look for these things and how to come up with them on your own. Okay, enough for, with false ones, let's look at true ones. So let's see an example of a double subset proof of the following theorem. For all sets A, B, and C, we have that A times B union C is equal to A times B union A times C. So before we get into the proof of this, um, this theorem is saying that you can distribute uh, the Cartesian product across unions. Now, a proof of this will involve a double subset proof. We'll show that a set on the left is a subset of the set on the right, 
and vice versa. So we'll start by proving the first subset direction. This is going to be a definition unwinding proof, so I'll write some stuff at the beginning and I'll write where we're aiming for and we'll slowly fill the gap. So to prove that it's a subset, you start with an element of the left-hand set. So we did that right here. We just called it Z. And the final line of our proof will be, so Z is in the set on the right. These are the same set. Now in order to do this, we're gonna slowly unwind until we have everything connected. So let's start to unwrap these definitions. If Z was going to be in the union, Z would either have to be in the first set or in the second set. Okay, now let's unwind the definition of what Cartesian product means. If you're in the Cartesian product, it means that you are a pair, Z equals XY, where X is from the first part and Y is from the second part, second uh, set. So we know that X is in A and Y is in B union C and Z is equal to the ordered pair XY. Can we unwind to definitions anymore? Yep, we can unwind the B union C. So let's do that. So this previous line says X is in A and Y is in B or Y is in C. So we've written everything out here. Now we can do the same thing down here. We can extract those definitions. So here we extract what it means for Z to be in A cross B. It means that there's an X in the first coordinate and a Y in the second coordinate. And so now our question is, can I get from this line to this line? This one takes a little bit of thinking. And essentially what's going on here is that these two are the same, except this one has um, X and A and Y, X and A uh, and uh, Y and C. So how are these two things related? Well, this is a logical identity that AND distributes over OR. So these two things are logically equivalent. You can check that using truth tables if you want. So here we're using P is the statement X is in A, y, the Q is the statement Y is in B, and R is the statement Y is in C. So there we go, that's the whole proof. Now we have to prove the other direction, show that the right-hand set is a subset of the left-hand set, but I'll leave that for you, it's very similar. Now I wanna see one final proof technique, which is uh, not the double subset technique, but it's another way of showing that two sets are equal. Let's start with this theorem, which is called De Morgan's Law for Sets, and we'll see why in a moment. It says, for sets A, B, and C, A set minus B union C is the same as A set minus B intersect A set minus C. So if you subtract a union, it becomes the intersection of two subtractions. This should remind us of De Morgan's Law. Now to do this, we're going to do a slightly different technique, which amounts to the same thing. Our goal is to show that X is in the left-hand set if and only if X is in the right-hand set. And to do this, we'll unwind definitions and we'll use equivalencies at every stage. So let's unwind these definitions. So unwrapping the definition of intersection, it becomes X is in this and this. Unwrapping the definition of uh, set difference, we get these definitions. Now here we've unwrapped the definition basically as far as it will go. So let's start unwrapping the definition from the top. So the definition of set difference here is X is in the first one and it's not true that X is in the second one. Here I wrote this slightly differently because I wanna use, um, I wanna use the definition of union first. So let's unwrap that. All right. So now we've unwrapped definitions as far as we can go. Now the question is, how do we get from here to here? 
Well, the first thing we want to do is we want to get these not an elements involved. So how do we distribute this negation through an or? This is De Morgan's law for logic. So De Morgan's law for logic says that um, if you distribute a negation across an or, it becomes an and with two negations. All right, now we're getting pretty close. These two statements look very similar. What's the difference between them? This one has an extra x and an element of a. That's the only difference. Now, because we've done all this work, now it's clear the, the key step that we have to add. We need to say that uh, we can just add an extra x as an element of a. So let's do that and we'll justify it. Since p is logically equivalent to p and p, we can introduce another x in a here. And then from here, we can rearrange all of the ends uh, to get what we want. There we go. This is a complete proof of De Morgan's law for sets. Zooming out, we see that we unwrapped the set definitions from the bottom and up unwrapped the set definitions from the top. And then all of the interesting work happened at the logical level. So this was really about logic identities. Let's take a moment to reflect. How are set identities related to identities in logic? What is a way to search for a counterexample systematically and not randomly? What set identity corresponds to this logic identity? Thank you very much and have a good day.